Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's really appreciated. What I'm going to tell you today is rather different than the approaches that I've seen presented in these presentations up to today in the workshop. So I think that the best way to introduce myself and my research activity is to directly state our scientific goal. We aim at developing novel strategies for an ultrafast manipulation of the macroscopic magnetic order in solids. This topic may have interest and relevance for both applied and fundamental science. And this becomes clear when you look at the different time scale of spin dynamics from two different perspectives. In the nanosecond regime, you can rely on the well-established framework of thermodynamics. And this regime of spin dynamics is already currently employed in nowadays technology. But when you start to look at shorter time scales, so picosecond and even femtosecond, well, then there is no more a well-established framework that you can use because we cannot invoke the concept of equilibrium. Actually, it turns out that doing experiments in this regime of spin dynamics is an extremely exciting journey because when you do experiments, very often you find phenomena which cannot be explained in terms of thermodynamics simply because they can't exist in a thermodynamic world. Today I will show you that on the femtosecond time scale of spin dynamics, you may encounter a very intriguing intermixing of classical and quantum worlds. The experimental tool allowing this kind of experiments is a femtosecond optical laser pulse. These kind of studies may become one day relevant for technology, provided that some challenges are met. First of all, we obviously need to learn how to manipulate magnets on the femtosecond time scale, but that's not enough. We must be able to, this, to do this in a controlled way, in a reproducible way, and in my opinion, it is unbelievably important that we do that by minimizing the energy dissipations. So, to sum up the entire goal of this research activity, we may use three words, fento, nano, and spin. Now, if you want to achieve such an ambitious goal, you have to choose the proper material. And we believe that the proper material is a dielectric antiferromagnet. We want to work with an insulating material, because if you have a metal, you have free electrons. And when you shine light on a metal, you excite the free electrons. These hot electrons give rise to a lot of interactions between electrons, the lattice, and spins, which complicate a lot the description of the spin dynamics. Moreover, free electrons absorb light. So there is this energy dissipation due to the absorption from the free electrons, which is something that we are trying to avoid. We would like to manipulate magnets with the minimum amount of energy dissipation. We also think that we should work with antiferromagnets. You guys know way better than I do that antiferromagnets have a lot of advantages on ferromagnets. But for us, the relevant point is the time scale of the spin dynamics. Everybody knows that spin dynamics in antiferromagnet is faster than in ferromagnet. What not everybody knows is that the light induced spin dynamics in an antiferromagnet is dramatically faster than in a ferromagnet. And this point will be clear in a few slides. I just would like to remark that when I use the word antiferromagnet today, I do refer to the easiest possible antiferromagnet, consisting of two collinear sublattices. So I will not talk about DMI or uh, um, spin textures, uh, skirmions, domain walls, nothing. Just discussing a collinear Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which we can, in the first instance, describe with the Heisenberg model. So if you have such a magnetic material and you want to start to think about the possible excited states of the magnetic system, you can measure or calculate the dispersions of magnets. This is the typical appearance of the magnet dispersion in an antiferromagnet. So far, I would say that at least 95% of experiments employing light on magnets have addressed K0 magnets, so magnets at the center of the Brillouin zone, simply because on this case, the wave vector of light is zero. However, the goal for us is fento, nano, and spin. So it is only natural to start to look away from the center of the Brillouin zone and start to look at the edges of the Brillouin zone because here magnons have femtosecond period, nanometer wavelength, and moreover, these magnons are strongly different from K0 magnons because these magnons are defined by the exchange interaction, meaning that the frequency is directly derived by the exchange energy. So, for this reason, some people call these magnons exchange magnons, but if you look at the period and the wavelength, I prefer to use the word femtonanomagnons. So our strategy is really clear. We want to study spin dynamics generated by triggering phantom nanomagnons on the ultra-fast time scale. 
The idea is really, really simple and straightforward, but it's not so easy to execute because there is no femtosecond stimulus that can simultaneously match the frequency and the wave vector of these high energy magnets. However, sometimes you can solve this problem, and now I'm going to show you how. Let's consider our Heisenberg antiferromagnet. I just would like to quickly remind you that S up and S down, these red arrows, are not spins on ionic sides. They are the total spins of the up and down sublattices. The total spin of the system is zero. The total magnetization is zero. It's an antiferromagnet. So we introduce another order parameter, which is the antiferromagnetic vector. We simply follow the textbook definitions here. Now, let's suppose that we can flip one spin per sublattice. If you do this operation, the total spin of each sublattice is decreased by a unity. As a consequence, the antiferromagnetic vector decreases as well. But even in the final state, the total spin is still zero. We didn't break the balance between the two sublattices. So this excitation is a delta S equals zero process. But now we are considering a magnetic material, an antiferromagnet. When you flip two spins in an antiferromagnet, you generate two magnets. This is unavoidable. If these two magnets have the same and opposite wave vector, k minus k, such excitation may conserve also the wave vector. So what I'm saying is that if we just look at the conservation laws, we have a process with delta S equals zero, delta K equals zero, which means that from the point of view of conservation laws, a light beam can induce this excited state. This state is called two magnon mode because it's about exciting pairs of magnon. And the only conditions that we get from conservation laws is that these magnons have equal and opposite wave vector, k minus k. In principle, each pair of magnon could satisfy this condition. In reality, it turns out that only magnons near the edges of the Brillouin zone are actually involved in the process. And this is due to the dispersion. The dispersion tends to flatten near the edges of the Brillouin zone, so the density of state is here the maximum. That's why only these magnons are involved in the process. Now, I'm talking about magnons near the edges of the Brillouin zone. It is therefore not surprising that the energy of the two magnon mode is given by the exchange energy. There is also a second term, delta, due to magnon magnon interaction, but this is a correction. The dominant contribution comes from the exchange energy. And let me now explain you why this kind of high energy dynamics can be observed only in an antiferromagnet. The key point here is that we flip two spins, but delta S is zero. If you take now a ferromagnet and you flip two spin, you get delta S2 or minus two, but you never get zero. That's why in an antiferromagnet, you can do this, you can have this process, but in a ferromagnet, you can't. So you cannot excite with light in a ferromagnet magnons near the edges of the Brillouin zone. That's why if light is your tool, in antiferromagnets, you have dramatically faster spin dynamics. Sure. Um, regarding this argument, so light typically is giving a delta L equals one hmm? kind of condition. So how does that come together with, with this argument that you presented? Because in this transition, there is no delta L. There is, no or, there is no spin orbit coupling, no orbital angular momentum. The only action of light in the magnetic system is a perturbation of the exchange interaction, which results in the generation of pairs of magnets. And this concept, what I just told you basically, is actually not a novel story that we came up with. It's a very old story, really well known by people involved in Raman spectroscopy. So let me show you the Raman spectrum of an Heisenberg antiferromagnet, potassium nickel fluoride, measure 1971. This huge mode that you see here is the two magnum mode. Uh, let me now spend just a few words about the sample, about the material. Potassium nickel trifluoride is a cubic Heisenberg antiferromagnet. In my opinion, it's the easiest possible three-dimensional antiferromagnet because basically you have the Heisenberg chain along the three cubic axes. The nil temperature is rather high, 246 Kelvin. And if you want to do optical experiments, the optical properties of this material are really experimentally friendly. We show here the absorption spectrum that we measure up to five electron volt. And you cannot see the band gap because the band gap is even at higher energies. It's at 6.2 electron volt. All the transitions that you see here are localized the transitions in the gap. There is a transparency region around 2.2 electron volt. And as you can see, there are some photon energies marked. These photon energies are marked here because we have some experience with this sample. 
A few years ago, we studied spin dynamics excited by low energy magnons, the usual K0 magnons. And back then, we found out that if you excite the material in the transparency region, so 2.2 electron volt, you can observe spin dynamics void of any contribution of heating of the lattice and of electrons, so only coming from excitation of spins. And this is what back then we call zero absorption regime. But the important thing for us is that we know that working in the transparency region, we can address only spins. We don't heat up other subsystems, which is interesting for us. Now, as I've mentioned, the two magnum mode is a Raman active process. If you want to excite a Raman active mode in an ultra fast way, the natural choice for excitation mechanism is impulsive stimulated Raman scattering. Before I tell you something about this, let me remind you quickly what stimulated Raman scattering is about. If you have a system in the ground state and you shine a light beam to frequency omega 1 so that this frequency is non resonant, so it doesn't match any transition, the system is brought into a virtual state. Then the system can decay, basically emitting a photon and generating a quasi particle. Now, I describe it for magnons, but the story is the same for a phonons or electric excitation. This magnon has frequency omega capital M. The light emitted has frequency omega 1 minus omega capital M. This is conventional spontaneous rama. Spontaneous rama is spontaneous, which means that the efficiency is extremely low. It's like 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. You can make it by far more efficient if you stimulate the process. You do that sending a second light beam at the frequency omega 2, so that omega 2 matches the frequency of the emitted light wave. So omega 2 must be equal in this cartoon to omega 1 minus omega capital M. Basically, if you do this, you combine spontaneous Raman with stimulated emission. And this is stimulated Raman scattering. This operation allows you to increase by roughly five orders of magnitude the efficiency of the process. However, all the experiments that we want to discuss are done with femtosecond laser pulses. These pulses, by being ultra short, are naturally broadband. So broadband that the two frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2, are contained in a single laser pulse. This is the condition that you have to satisfy to be able to excite a mode, so that the two frequencies relevant are contained in a single laser pulse. Obviously, you can translate this condition from the frequency domain into the time domain. And in the time domain, it means that the laser pulse must be shorter than the period of the mode that you want to excite. The period of the two magnum mode is 45 femtoseconds, so we need to use 10 femtosecond laser pulses, which is not so straightforward. If you want to use 100 femtosecond laser pulses, you can rely on fully commercial equipment. If you want to go from 100 to 10, you have to do something rather complicated by yourself. The experiment that we perform is a canonical magneto-optical pump probe experiment which basically means that we have two light beams. A very strong one, the pump, which has the goal of exciting spin dynamics. And we have a second light beam, much weaker, the probe, which interacts with the sample. It is weak, so it's not supposed to induce anything, just to probe what happens in the sample. Then it's recollected and measured. Measuring the probe, we can try to understand how the sample was modified by the original photo excitation. Since we want to measure the entire dynamical response, we can delay in time these two pulses with this delay delta t, and we change the delay continuously. So you can measure from the photo excitation until the moment that the dynamics is totally exhausted. We want to measure spin dynamics, so we have to rely on magneto-optics. And here I would like to make a point. I have the feeling that when people say magneto-optics, in general, there is the belief that only the Faraday effect and Kerak effect exist. Actually, there is a plethora of magneto-optical effects of higher order, which are commonly not really much used. But in this case, we cannot use Faraday rotation and we cannot even rely on the Kerr effect because these processes are linear in the spin deviation. And the process that we want to study is delta s equals zero, not delta s equals one. So we can't use linear effects. We have to use quadratic effects, in particular, a quadratic effect which is proportional to spins belonging on both sublattices. In this notation, i and j are ionic sites of nearest neighbor spins. But if the system has exchanged only among nearest neighbors, if you look at spins of nearest neighbors, let's say, sites, they belong automatically to different sublattices. So you have these two spins belonging on different sites and different sublattices. And this is necessary because we want to excite a mode which can be induced only flipping one spin per sublattices. Both sublattices are involved. So we have to be sensitive to both of them.
please notice that this pin correlation function is the same term that you get in the Heisenberg term of the Hamiltonian. It's exactly the same spin correlation function. Now, finally, I can show you our data. The first experiment that we performed revealed oscillation, very well pronounced, at the frequency of 22 terahertz, so a period of 45 femto, and with a lifetime of roughly 500 femtoseconds. This number match well, I would say, the peak position and the bandwidth of the two magnum mode observed in Raman spectroscopy. Obviously, it is not enough to claim that we did uh, induce and we did probe that mode. So we measure more, we study the temperature dependence of the effect. And we observe that when you approach the nil point, the lifetime and the frequency of the oscillations slightly decrease. Then we plot with the blue dots uh, the lifetime, the trend for lifetime and frequency of these oscillations, and we compare them with the red dots. The red dots are the result of a spontaneous Raman experiment that we performed ourselves on the same specimen. Now, the standing agreement among these curves allows to conclude that we did excite and we did probe the two magnum mode. Okay, but now think back at the dispersion. The two magnum mode lives at the edges of the brilliant zone in the blue part of the dispersion. So this means that if you look at these oscillations, what you're actually looking at are coherent magnums with a frequency of 22 terahertz, a wavelength of one nanometer. I've mentioned that we measure magneto-optics, we measure dynamics of the spin correlation function, but we are actually interested in understanding how this peculiar excitation changes the magnetic state. So we want to relate this information to the dynamics of the order parameter. We develop in collaboration with uh, some theorists, uh, basically a model, and this model shows that if you neglect magnum magnum interaction, the time dependence of these, these two quantities is the same. This allows to interpret the oscillations that we measure as coherent longitudinal oscillations of the order parameter. The, exper the experiment is a magnet-optical experiment, and the quantity detected is the spin correlation function. But in this sample, the only spin correlation function relevant is among nearest neighbors. There is only exchange among nearest neighbors. So this means that with magneto-optics, you can detect the femtosecond evolutions of correlations between spins, which are basically four Armstrongs away in the unicell. And that's already, in my opinion, at least something interesting. But our goal is to manipulate the magnetic order on these time scales. So we decided to take this concept and bring it to the next level. First, we excite the system with one laser pulse and we observe the usual oscillations. Then we change the polarization of our pump beam and we observe that the sign of the signal is reversed. So, okay, we can perform a coherent control of the phase of the oscillations. Now, we want to manipulate also the amplitude and this is done in a double pump pulse excitation scheme. So you take two pump pulses with a delay. If this delay is set equal to the period of the two magnum mode, the oscillations are enhanced. If the delay is set equal to half the period of the two magnum mode, these oscillations are actually suppressed. But this means that we did achieve in these experiments a coherent manipulation of the macroscopic order parameter on a 10 femtosecond time scale. Now, when you do such an experiment, you open up basically a novel physical regime. You do something that carries some questions, doubts, and sometimes also misinterpretations. So for me, a point very tough to digest is about the length scale of the dynamics. I think I've made quite a point in telling you that we measure dynamics of so the correlation, spin-spin correlation. But the typical length scale of these dynamics is on the order of one nanometer. I also told you that the experiment is magneto-optical. Magneto-optics is a macroscopic method. It's not a method sensitive to a single spin. It's not like spin-polarized STM. And this for me was a bit strange to understand and tough to understand. How can we see something that takes place on a one nanometer length scale with magneto-optics? So what we were looking for was an experimental fingerprint that convinced that basically only short wavelength magnets are involved in this signal. There is no contribution by any long wavelength magnets. So we started to address this point by looking back at the Raman literature. Because back then those guys were really sure that without any doubt, in this Raman acting mode, there were only short wavelength magnets and nothing else. They were convinced of this because they measured for several systems the temperature dependence and they observed signal above the nil point in the paramagnetic phase. Here I'm showing the data for a slightly different antiferromagnet. And in this study, the authors report that they can observe the two magnum mode 
up to temperatures 1.5 times higher than the nil point. To be fair, some other rotors measure the same compound and they report even signal up to three times the nil point. Interpretation of these results is rather straightforward. If you cool down your antiferromagnets below the nil temperature, there is long range order. Now, you increase the temperature, at the nil point, the long range order is lost. But this doesn't mean that the exchange is destroyed, that any spin correlation is destroyed. This means that in the system there is enough thermal energy to compete with the magnetic energy. If you increase the temperature a little bit more and you go into the paramagnetic regime, short range spin correlation survive. And these are exactly the quantity probe in these experiments. So, one of the consequences of this very simple argument is that if you now look at long wavelength magnets, K0 magnets, so ma same magnets involved like in fMR mode, they are responsible or they're related to the long range order, they must soften at the near point. This is something that we all know, measured in 1000 samples, just showing the data for this specific compound, and so far so good, nothing strange. But here comes the issue. The issue is that if you now go back, you look at all possible available data in the literature for high energy magnets observed in the time domain, you will never see signal above the nil point. You will also never see signal at the nil point. The signal goes down a little bit before. This observation motivated some authors a few years ago in claiming in one of the papers that if you do the experiment in the time domain, there is an unavoidable and necessary contribution from long wavelength magnets. And this point is, in my opinion, really disturbing. Because doing an experiment in the frequency domain or in the time domain on a Raman active mode means doing an experiment which is defined by the same cross-section. And with the exception of the two-magnet mode, if you compare these two approaches for phono mode or for any other magnetic mode, there has never been reported such a discrepancy. So we want to address this point, and we want to do this with a very simple strategy. We take the two samples that I've been talking about, the cubic one and now the other sample, potassium 2, nickel I4, and we want to compare them for a very simple reason. You have just to know two things about these samples. Short wavelength magnets are the same, in the sense that the super exchange pattern is the same, with only the difference in the amount of nearest neighbor. Six for the cube, four for the tetragonal system. But the long wavelength magnets are really different. In one case, you have a very weak magnetocrystalline cubic anisotropy. In this case, you have a rather strong uniaxial anisotropy. So the idea is, let's measure the temperature dependence of both compounds. If there is any softening, long wavelength magnets may play a role. And if the softening is different from in these two compounds, that should strengthen the point that long wavelength magnets are involved. Because these long wavelength magnets are different in these two systems. So you have already seen the data for the cubic compound. Now let me show you the data for, pardon, the data for the tetragonal system. And this plot probably is not telling you much. It is much more useful to compare all the data together. And this is done in this plot. So blue and green dots are the results of the time domain experiment. The dashed lines are spontaneous Raman experiments. So there is no inconsistency. I would like to make you notice that the last point here for the green data, so the tetragonal system, was obtained at temperatures higher than the nil point when the system was just entered in the paramagnetic phase. The black dots are long wavelength magnets that we measured in the cubic system. Of course, as we discussed, as it should be, it softens. The fact that there is no softening of the high frequency magnets is the experimental fingerprint that we were looking for. So basically, we can now state that in the hour signal, there is no contribution from long wavelength magnets, which is fine. This experiment and this point actually triggered a small follow up question. What is the role of temperature in all this story, in high energy magnets? The, the, the damping of the oscillation is mainly driven by magnum magnum interaction. This is well established. So OK, you change the temperature, you change the thermal population of magnets, magnum magnum interaction changes. But we also know now that at the nil point, there is no softening of high energy magnets. So we started to think about what could be the figure of merit to define a temperature at which this particular mode softens. We did not develop a rigorous theory. We just tried to formulate a guess. And the guess is the following. If we can populate thermally these high energy magnets, magnum magnum interaction is even stronger. If the population is so 
uh, let's say, intense, the magnum magnum interaction is really, really strong, this might compete with the establishing of the coherent state. To test in a very rough way this gas, we calculated the temperature required to populate thermally high energy magnets in both compounds. In both cases, this temperature turned out to be much higher than the nil point, which is consistent with the all investigations reported by spontaneous Raman spectroscopy. So even if we did not develop a full rigorously um, derived theory, I think we're looking at the proper direction. Now, I would like to discuss the aspect of the Fenton nanomagnonics, which is by far the most interesting one, which has to do with the dynamics of the order parameter. Now you know that when we excite these high energy magnets, we do a delta S equals zero excitation. So we have an antiferromagnet. There is no total spin before we pump. There is no total spin when we pump. There is no total spin after we pump. There is no magnetization dynamics. If you have spin dynamics in an antiferromagnet, but no magnetization dynamics, these two statements may coexist only if your dynamics is purely longitudinal. If you have precession in an antiferromagnet, you get in the transient state a magnetization along certain directions. So what we conclude here is that the spin dynamics is purely longitudinal. This statement is actually important and rather big, so I want to motivate it also <coughs> from another point of view. Let's consider the light spin interaction, the light matter interaction energy in this case. The term that you see here is the standard choice for the two magnum mode. It's not even something that we wrote down. It's taken from the literature. Let's just focus on the spin dependence, in particular the term in the box. As you know, you can rewrite the ladder operators as Sx, Sx plus Sy, Sy. This means that this term is mathematically symmetric in the xy plane. Now, we have spins along the z direction before we pump. The only interaction relevant is described by a light matter interaction term, which is symmetric in the xy plane. The result is that the dynamics can be only longitudinal. If you want to trigger a precession, you must select an Sx or a Sy component to start the precession. We do this typically with a magnetic field or with a spin orbit coupling. But in this case, there is no magnetic field. There is no spin orbit coupling in this problem. There is in the material, but it's not showing up here. The only relevant interaction is the exchange interaction. And the only light matter interaction is this one, fully symmetric in the xy plane. Now, now that we know that the dynamics is longitudinal, I would like to remind something really basic, something that we know from thermodynamics. If you live in a thermodynamic world, the magnetization of a magnet is a function of the temperature. So you cool down the magnet, magnetization is strong, you heat it up, the magnetization shrinks. The same story holds for the sublattice, spin sublattice of an antiferromagnet, and therefore for the antiferromagnetic vector. Now, thinking in this perspective, let's look at these oscillations. If you apply thermodynamic logic, then you have to conclude that the temperature is oscillating at the frequency of 22 terahertz, and that we can reverse the phase of the oscillation of the temperature, changing the polarization of light. Uh, this, in my opinion, is already a good reason to start to step away from this kind of interpretation, but there are more reasons. In particular, when you describe optical experiments, typically we use effective fields to describe the interaction of light on spins, in this case, we cannot. We cannot even use conventional equation of motion, the kinds of LLG equations. There are torque equations. We can't have any torque because there is no precession. We cannot use them. Even more, in this specific case, we cannot even rely on the mean field approach, which is really successful in describing low energy spin dynamics. As we discussed a few days ago during the talk of Akash, in this mean field approach, the dynamics of a single spin and the interaction of a single spin with the magnetic environment is defined only via the mean field. So if you try to perform this operation when i and j are two different ionic sites, so it's a correlation in space, the only contribution can come from the expectation value of the single spins, because any kind of correlation is washed out by the mean field. But now you know that the Fenton nanomagnonics is all about measuring spin correlation functions. In particular, if you work hard in the lab, you can measure this quantity along each Cartesian axis. It's never zero, although it changes in sign and amplitude, but it's non-zero. On the other hand, if there is no macroscopic precession, the expectation value of these two quantities on the x and y axis is zero, which means that we break this equality and we cannot use the mean field approach. So basically, 
uh, what we did, actually, what our collaborators from uh, professionals of theory did, was driving a quantum mechanical model with a very well-defined goal, to derive a proper equation of motion for coherent longitudinal oscillations of the order parameter, which globally conserve spins. Uh, spins must be conserved. I will not go through the whole model, but I will just tell you very quickly uh, the main points. So the theory was derived in a harmonic approximation, a glatty magnum magnon interaction, which means that in the end we will not get any damping from the theory because magnum magnon interaction is the only source of damping here. Then, the time, uh, uh, let's say the non-equilibrium state is assumed to be a coherent state. This is not a wild assumption because with experiments we demonstrated the coherent control. With this state, you can formally derive an equation of motion using a Poissonian formalism. Then you can convert this formal equation of motion into equation of motion for the order parameter. Once you plugged in the analytic expression of the mu parameter, you get that this quantity is oscillating at the frequency of the two magnum mode. And this is the longitudinal components of uh, the order parameter. So what I've shown you basically now is that if you want to work with high energy magnets, you can do it in a fully coherent way. You can excite in a coherent way by passive stimulated drama. You can manipulate the phase and the amplitude. And you can therefore manipulate the dynamics of the order parameter. What I haven't shown you is how to use high energy magnets to drive magnetic phase transition. This should be extremely interesting to look at. Because now you have the highest frequency magnets on very short landscape, and if you excite them, you can try to drive strong changes in the magnetic system. I haven't shown you this because basically we haven't done it. And we haven't done it because we excited with Raman. If you excite with Raman, as I, I was explaining, the excitation is non resonant. Light is not absorbed, it's scattered. So to put it bluntly, you generate a little amount of magnets in that way. I think that if you want to really drive strong magnetic phase transition or strong perturbations of the magnetic system, you should try to go for a resonant excitation of these magnets. There are, in principle, several options. You can try to look for a material in which there is a dipole moment depending on the exchange interaction. You can also try to look for a system when the two magnum process is assisted by the lattice. So the lattice can give a dipole moment for a resonant excitation. Or again, you can try to dig back in the literature and use something that was very well studied and also very well forgotten now, which is the so-called exciton magnum. If you have these dielectric antiferromagnets that we use nowadays in, in magnetism, there are several transitions in the gap. Some of these DD transitions, which are, which are basically Frankel excitons, coupled with magnons. So in principle, they're forbidden, they're DD transition. They are weakly allowed because they couple to some other excitations, typically phonons. In some cases, they can couple with magnons. What these people studied long ago is that they couple typically to high energy magnons. This is uh, an option that I've been exploring for the last year. And even if the work is not fully complete yet, I feel rather confident in stating that in this way, we can drive magnetic phase transitions in less than one picosecond. So in conclusion, today I've shown you that there is something called phantom nanomagnonics. I've told you almost everything I know about this. And we really like it. We're really excited by the phantom nanomagnonics because there is so much that we don't know. Today, I mentioned that this regime of spin dynamics is quantum. And e the theory goes even farther than that. The theory predicts that these pairs of magnets are quantum mechanically entangled. So we would like to devise an experiment in which we can really see an experimental fingerprint of the quantum nature and possibly, hopefully, also the entanglement. Moreover, there is another big chapter that we haven't addressed yet, which is the propagation in space of these magnets. It is something that, to be honest, uh, is very hard to uh, predict. Looking also at recent experiments from Ludo and his group, uh, when they start to look at the propagation dynamics of um, small short wavelength magnets. So it's not an easy problem even to predict. We don't have an expectation about that. It is really tough technically to measure. But this is something that sooner or later we have to deal with. Obviously, nowadays, experimental physics is a huge team effort. I could have done nothing of what I've shown you here today without the help and contribution of all the unbelievable people whose names are here on the slides. So I would like now to conclude my presentation by thanking all of you for your attention.